Hey everybody, this video is going to be all about how to predict products of various reactions. Okay, the first one that we're going to start with is magnesium plus fluorine. So when we are predicting products of various reactions, we want to be able to get used to recognizing what type of reaction we're looking at. So the first thing to notice about this one is that we have two elements um, that are reactants. And so whenever you have two elements as reactants, it's a sign that it is going to be a synthesis or combination reaction. So here we have magnesium plus fluorine. And whenever we recognize a synthesis reaction along with a couple other reactions, um, we always want to think about their charges because when they come together to form a compound, they're usually ionic compounds, and in order to effectively write the correct formula of that compound, we need to know their charges so that we can make sure that the compound is neutralized. So for magnesium plus fluorine, if we check our periodic table, magnesium is in column number two. So it has two valence electrons and it always forms a plus two charge. And fluorine is a halogen, it has seven valence electrons, so it always forms a minus one charge. So when magnesium and fluorine come together, we'll need two fluorine ions in order to cancel out the positive two magnesium. So we end up with MgF2. Now sometimes a mistake that students make is as they're writing this, they just carry over the subscripts. But that is not why this two is here. This two is not here because fluorine is diatomic. The only time it matters if fluorine or an element is diatomic is if it is alone. Once it's in a compound, you do have to compare the charges and then pick out um, the subscript from there. So be really careful with that. The next one we're gonna do is H2O as a reactant. So H2O is one compound before the arrow, and right away you guys should be thinking, ah, oh, that's decomposition. This is a decomposition reaction. It's the only reaction where there's only one substance before the arrow. So if we think to ourselves, okay, how does water break down? Well, there's only two elements in water, hydrogen and oxygen. So those are our products. So we have hydrogen plus oxygen as products. But whenever we have individual elements, we always want to ask ourselves, is it diatomic? And hydrogen is a diatomic element, so it gets a two. And oxygen is also diatomic, so it gets a two as well. At this point, we're done. So this was synthesis up here, and this was decomposition here. All right. Kind of hard to see. I don't know if you guys can tell. Um, so here we have potassium fluoride plus chlorine and potassium bromide plus chlorine. These are both single displacement reactions. I'm going to write that up here. Single displacement. Now, whenever you have a single displacement reaction, there's a set. There's a an extra step with them. So the only way a reaction will occur is if the outer element, and in this case the chlorine in both of these reactions, if the outer element is more reactive than whatever it's going to kick out of the compound. So a couple things because I might be going too fast. The way I recognize that this was single displacement is because we have a compound plus an element all as reactants, so that single displacement. Now, in order to figure out what element is going to be kicked out of this compound, we have to pay attention to charges again, kind of like in the synthesis reaction we just did. So if we're paying attention to charges, potassium forms a plus one charge, fluorine is a minus one charge, Chlorine always forms a negative one charge. So the element that is outside the arrow, not outside the arrow, outside of the compound is 
a negative charge. So it's going to kick out the negative from within the compound, but only if it is more reactive than whatever it's going to kick out. So we have to check something called the activity series. So if we take a look at our activity series, it should be on the back of your yellow polyatomic ion sheet. For anions on the activity series, it's on the right-hand side of the page. So we're going to compare these two, fluorine and chlorine. If chlorine is higher on the list, then it has enough oomph to kick out the fluorine. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but fluorine is higher. It is the most active, so this chlorine does not have enough power to kick it out of the compound. So what we do when this happens is we simply write down no reaction. And another way that you can indicate that is just by putting an N, R, okay? So no reaction will occur here. So I wrote another one um, so that I could show you one where a reaction does happen. So for this one, again, we recognize it's single displacement. Uh, we have to check the activity series, but in order to know what to check on the activity series, we have to know the charges of each. So potassium is always a plus one, bromine always forms a minus one, and chlorine forms a negative one as well. So in order for this reaction to occur, chlorine must be more reactive than whatever it's going to kick out of the compound. And we know what it's going to kick out of the compound by comparing the charges. So chlorine is an anion when it's in an ionic compound, so it, it will kick out the anion, bromine. So we need to compare the chlorine and the bromine on the activity series. And if you take a look, Chlorine is higher in the activity series than bromine is, so this reaction will occur. So the chlorine is going to kick the bromine out. So one of our products is just plain old bromine. Since it's an individual element, we have to ask ourselves if it's diatomic, and it is diatomic, so it gets a 2. And then we have potassium chloride that will form. This potassium will come together with that chlorine and the bromine gets kicked out. So again, we can't carry over subscripts. We do have to figure out what the compound is based off of their charges. Potassium always forms plus one charge. Chlorine always forms a negative one charge. And so those are both equal. So it cancels out as a one-to-one -one ratio within the compound. So the compound for potassium chloride is just KCl. And that's it. Okay, there are two more reactions that I'm gonna go through with you guys. The first one is magnesium nitrate plus potassium hydroxide. Right away, you should see that this is a compound plus a compound. So this is a double displacement reaction. You have two ionic compounds that end up forming two ionic compounds. So we do have to indicate the charges to help ourselves out. So magnesium, if we look it up on the periodic table, magnesium's in group two, it always forms a plus two charge. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion, and if you take a look at your yellow handout and find nitrate, nitrate has a charge of a negative one. That's why it needed two of these in the compound in order to neutralize out the compound. Potassium always forms a plus one charge. And hydroxide, if it helps you, you can put parentheses around your polyatomics. Hydroxide always forms a negative one charge. Hydroxide can be found on the polyatomic ion sheet as well, and it's always a negative one charge. So in a double displacement reaction, you have a cation getting a new partner, and then the anions get new partners. So it's always kind of like the same pattern. The outside things go together, the inside things go together. Another way that you can think about it is that magnesium is a cation, so it's positive. It needs a negative partner. It's, al it's already with this nitrate, with, which is negative, so the only other negative thing is this hydroxide. 
happen. So I'm going to just draw some lines here because it always kind of oops, ends up, let's get rid of that one, ends up that the outside ions go together, the inside ions go together. So here we are going to end up with magnesium hydroxide, but we have to build the formula properly. Magnesium has a plus two charge. Each hydroxide has a minus one. So we are going to need two hydroxides in order to cancel out the positive two magnesium. So one of the products here is going to be MgOH in parentheses because we need two of them. And we'll put our little plus sign here. Then we have nitrate and potassium. Now when we form our ionic compounds, it, is, it does have to go in a specific order. So we can't put the nitrate then the potassium down. It always goes cation then anion. So cations are positive, so we do have to write the potassium first and then the nitrate. So potassium is positive by one, nitrate is negative by one, so they'll be in a compound in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we end up getting KNO3. And that's it for that one. This last reaction is the easiest one to do. Uh, so when we recognize that we have an O2 in this reaction, we know it's going to be combustion. Since a hydrocarbon is involved, a hydrocarbon is anything with a hydrogen and a carbon. That's why it's called a hydrocarbon. So when you have oxygen plus a hydrocarbon, then you are going to end up always with the same exact products of CO2 and H2O. So the product of a hydrocarbon plus an oxygen is always CO2 plus H2O. And that's it. Now, a lot of times students get concerned over the fact of like, what order do I write these products in? It doesn't matter. Um, it's as if you were listing off your friends in no particular order, they're all your friends. So you could have either written CO2 plus H2O or H2O plus CO2, and that would be completely fine. Now there is one other thing I wanna cover, synthesis combustion. And I didn't write one down for this, because I didn't think about it until I was talking. So if we're gonna do a synthesis combustion reaction, let's do calcium, calcium plus oxygen, okay? So I'll do Ca plus O, and it's diatomic, so there's a two on there. Right away, we do see the O2, so we know that it's gonna be combustion but there's two pure elements, so that equals synthesis. This is a synthesis combustion reaction, so it's not gonna equal CO2 and H2O because there's no carbon and there's no hydrogen in the reactants. So this is just a synthesis reaction where we need to pay attention to the charges and build a single compound. So calcium is in group two, it always forms a plus two charge when it's in a compound, um, an ionic compound, and oxygen always forms a negative two charge when it's in a compound because it has six valence electrons, so it gains two. So when we form the compound of calcium oxide, it's simply going to be a one-to-one -one ratio since these charges cancel. So it's just CaO as the product here. So be careful when it gets to, um, O2 is a reactant, you always wanna double check if it's a pure element as the other reactant, then it's synthesis combustion and your products will not be CO2 and H2O. They're just going to combine and form an ionic compound. But if you do have a hydrocarbon, then your products would be CO2 and H2O. All right, that's all I have for you. I hope um, that this makes sense and let me know if you have any